This is the disclaimer for Wildlife Control Consultant and Pest Geek Podcast with Living the Wildlife Podcast. Always follow national, state, provincial, and local laws when using pesticides and or other control methods to manage pests. Wildlife Control Consultant, LLC, Pest Geek Podcast, Living the Wildlife Podcast, Stephen M. Van Tassel, or their or his affiliates are not responsible for followers' use of the information provided here. Hi everyone, Stephen Van Tassel here, Wildlife Control Consultant, bringing you another episode of Living the Wildlife as part of the Pest Geek Podcast family. Hey, glad to have you on board. I do want to ask you for to take a moment and subscribe to the channel. You can also reach out to me at wildlifecontrolconsultant at gmail.com. That's wildlifecontrolconsultant at gmail.com. Would love to hear from you if you have ideas for new shows. Perhaps you'd like to be on the show. Maybe you have a product or service that you'd want to get out to a wider area. Definitely reach out to me. A lot of those interviews are just simply uh, free. Uh, and of course, we're always willing to accept advertisers uh, if you're looking to get out to the wildlife control professional community. It has uh, kind of a short short edition today. I'm going to be going out and doing some uh, pr prairie dog work later this morning. and But I wanted to get my podcast out here to you in revisit a topic that I addressed in 2018. I don't know how many of you go back and listen to the earlier podcasts. I tried not to repeat topics per se, but uh, this is certainly one that is important to discuss, especially as we start looking at getting to the fall when many people start having uh, rodent, rodent control issues and temperatures start to drop a lot of times rodents are looking for places of heat. Although when I was in Kansas, I was definitely spoken to about the fact that guys were having issues with rodents during the heat of summer, uh, perhaps trying to get into someplace cooler. Uh, but in any event, um, I'll take them at their word. But certainly for most of us, rodent pressure is greatest. And of course, in the fall months, you know, we have harvest season, rodents are moving, are uh, losing their habitat area, move to the surrounding structures. And then of course, they're always looking for places to uh, stay warm over the colder winters. Those of you in the deep south, it may not matter that much, but I'd love to hear from you again. You can reach out to me at wildlifecontrolconsultant at gmail.com. So why do I bring all this up? The issue of risk. This is probably one of the most difficult topics and subjects you can have with your client. And that is, how do you explain the threat that the use of rodenticides or the use of a trap, we're gonna focus on rodenticides here, but I want those of you that, you that don't use rodenticides that are just using traps, understand that this information is applicable to you as well. Don't just simply tune out, oh, I don't deal with pesticides, I deal with something safe. All of our control methods involve risk. Even those of you who think that I'm non-lethal, that is simply not true. Uh, when you look at fences, fences kill animals all the time. So you think, oh, I'm going to put up a fence that's not harming anything. Uh, not necessarily true. You know, what kind of fence is it? So we need to be careful and understand that all of our activities involve some level of risk. But how do we explain risk to people that aren't familiar with the complexities of risk? Because the research tends to suggest, and if you don't believe the research, I mean, then certainly think of it in terms of your own life, that we psychologically tend to amplify risks for things that we don't understand or that we are not as familiar with or that we don't feel that we have control. For example, a lot of people are afraid of flying. Why are they afraid of flying? Well, because they're not in the pilot seat. So it's really an issue of control. Well, they'll drive across the country, but they won't fly across the country because when they're driving, their attitude is, I'm familiar with driving. I know how I drive. I know what I'm doing. I'm in control. Even though we know that in terms of on a mile by mile basis, people that driving is more dangerous than flying. 
However, we have to balance that, of course. And that is, you can be in an accident with a vehicle and walk away. How many times, how many accidents can you have in a plane and walk away? So another aspect of risk is how catastrophic is the event, but I'm kind of getting away ahead of myself. So you can see how complex this is. And so let's let's uh, delve with this. So you're often gonna get this question, will that rodenticide hurt my pets? For those of you that are dealing with traps, just put in the word traps for rodenticide, right? So will that trap hurt my pet? Well, and you can have an answer for that sort of thing. So let's take a look here. All right, so the short answer is yes. That rodenticide can kill your pet or harm your pet. It can harm your children. Same way with certain traps, right? They can kill your pets or they can harm your pets. How are we gonna address these? Say, so I use cage traps. Don't understand cage traps can harm animals as well. If you're not clear on that, get a copy of my book, Being Kind to Animal, Animal Pests, talks about some issues with, with uh, cage and box traps. So there can be harm there. Maybe less, less likely to have severe harm, but there certainly can be harm there. So when it comes to rodenticides, there can be harm, but the risk of this harm is more complicated than just simply saying yes, right? So the short answer is yes, but that is an incomplete answer. There is more involved in dealing with risk with rodenticides or traps than what meets the eye. And so let's try to explore that a little bit more. It's important that you explain to your client the difference between the probability of harm and the actual effect. So risk is a probability. What are the chances that something bad will happen? Harm discusses what is the severity of that harm if we actually encounter it. And again, I gave that illustration, right? So if we have my, if we talk about accidents with planes versus vehicles, the risk of having an accident with a vehicle is significantly higher than having, than the risk of an accident with a plane. But what, when we talk about what the harm is though, what's the likelihood of you being injured well, you can have a lot of vehicle accidents and walk away, but when you have a plane crash, the harm tends to be very high. Let's put this in terms of rabies. The likelihood that an American citizen is going to encounter rabies is extraordinarily low. However, when you are potentially exposed, the harm is generally death. So that's a pretty big risk, I mean, pretty big uh, harm element. So that if that bat, when that bat, when you encounter that bat in your bedroom, the probability of that bat being rabid is probably three to 5%. But if it is rabid and you were exposed, the likelihood of you dying is 100%. So this is these two elements have to be balanced when you're talking about the probability of which is the risk versus what is the effect if we have that event occur. All right? So make sure you separate with your client risk and harm. Now I'm using some very dramatic examples so, for example, they say, well, what is the risk of you catching, you know, you're putting cage traps in the backyard? And what is the, what is the risk likelihood of you catching my neighbor's cat? And you're like, well, the risk may be very high. I can try to reduce the risk maybe by using sweet baits, for example, but I can't say it's zero. However, the risk the likelihood of harm to the cat is very low because we're checking the traps regularly. You can call me if you see the cat caught. I'm using, you know, traps that are, you know, half inch by one inch mesh. I have, 
uh, you know, padding in there and I have maybe water in there and whatever the case, it's put in the shade. So even though the risk is relatively high, the harm, like likelihood of harm is extremely low. And that's how we need to talk about separating risk and harm. You can see how, because this is very abstract and people have trouble with numbers, right? Look, people buy lottery tickets all the time. Oh, this is going to be the winner. Well, the likelihood of them winning is extraordinarily low, right? Because we don't understand the nature of probability and chance. So here's another way of explaining another way of explaining risk and harm. That's the hazard. So the hazard equals, make, as, an, as an equation, exposure, what's the likelihood of you being exposed, times the toxicity. How lethal is this particular rodenticide? So exposure is just a, an umbrella term that covers how distributed is the toxicant, how available is the toxicant? So distribution is how many bait stations do you have in the area? All right, let's say you have 20. Well, that's that raises the likelihood of exposure. But then you have to say, well, how strong are those bait stations? How available is it to the organism that's going to go after it? Well, if you have good bait stations, maybe you use steel, for example. Well, what's the likelihood of a dog getting into that bait station? Well, it's pretty low, so it's not really available, is it? You have a lot of it out there, but they really can't access it, right? It's sort of like, you know, you can have a gun on the wall, but if it's all locked up and, you know, maybe the firing pin's removed, what's the risk of the gun, right? It's, right? it's available, but it doesn't work. So who's it going to harm? I mean, I guess you could use it as a club, but that's not usually not what we're talking about, right? Well, how about the animal's individual behavior? You know, how aggressive is this? Is it a pit bull that's going to chew through steel? Probably, you know, I doubt even the pit bull's going to do that, right? And what are the population dynamics? How, how many animals are going to be going after those bait stations? So that's the exposure part of the equation. Now, when we deal with toxicity, we have to ask the question, well, what's the LD50? And what's the persistence of the, tox the toxic. In other words, does it dissipate relatively quickly or is it highly toxic? Is Does it require a lot to be eaten? Whatever the case may be. So that talks about hazard. So when we're dealing with risk, another way of understanding risk is that risk equals probability times the toxicity or severity times exposure. So let me unpack this a little bit more for you, those, especially those of you who aren't able to see the slide. So probability is what is the likelihood that a negative or an unwanted event is going to occur. The toxicity and severity refer to what are the consequences of that negative event. Are, is it just morbidity? Morbidity is where it reduces the uh, quality of life of the organism. Mortality is the likelihood of killing the organism, right? So sometimes we may not be killed by an event, but we could be harmed to, so our quality of life is, is reduced. And then the exposure is what is the frequency of our exposure to the product? How long are we exposed to the product? And what extent? In other words, it's a diff there's a difference between touching a rodenticide with your bare fingers versus taking a block of rodenticide and rubbing it all over your body, right? That's the extent of your exposure. Now, don't do that. The labels require you to wear gloves, of course, right? Don't be stupid. But the point is, is that how, how often are you encountering a rodenticide how long is that encounter when you do encounter it? And then how, how much of your body is exposed to that particular toxicant? Now, remember, the way this is written, this is written for all sorts of risks and pesticides, especially like, you know, herbicides, for instance, right? So if, but if you're dealing with rodenticides 
on a daily basis, well, then your frequency, your risk of, risk of exposure is increased because you're dealing with it so often, right? So risk in this sense is the probability times the toxicity times the exposure. Now, the other aspect of understanding risk is indeterminism. In other words, we don't know the future. And this is what a lot of our clients are really afraid of. And they're afraid of the unknown. So in other words, there are known unknowns. In other words, we know what we don't know. And there are also unknown unknowns. In other words, we don't know what we don't know. For, for example, what's an example of a known unknown? Well, we know that dogs can attack bait stations. What we don't know is what's the likelihood of dogs in this particular neighborhood attacking the bait stations. But we know that dogs can be at risk. So we we may know we may go to a client's house and know that there's no children there they don't have any children they don't have any pets and you're like oh okay well the risk of a non-target exposure here is really low but what you didn't know was that their grandparents in two weeks from now the whole clan is coming and there's going to be 10 children under the age of eight around the house you did not know that that was an unknown unknown, right? And you don't know how, how well the parents monitor their children, okay? So this is what your clients are feeling when you're talking to them about rodenticides. Some of them are gonna be educated enough to know that rodenticides are risky, but they don't know enough to realize how to balance the risk reward ratio. And it's your job to help them understand, not to convince them necessarily to have rodenticides, but to help them understand whether this, their situation is, it's a prudent choice. And this is where you've got to interview them and discuss that with them. So again, chance, in this sense is the risk equals the probability times the severity times the exposure. We already discussed that. The uncertainty is we don't know what we don't know or what do we know what we don't know and how will people react to an unknown? Sometimes you can tell the client, you know, there's a risk of this, you can, there's a risk of this, there's a risk of this, but they're so frustrated with their rodent problem, they're not hearing you. And they're signing your contract and you're putting your bait stations down and all of a sudden their little chihuahua gets, in, gets into some bait and they're having a conniption fit because they didn't hear you initially because they were so frustrated and angry about the mice that they were having problems with that they didn't hear you talk about your dog, their dog. So you don't know how they're gonna react. Some people are gonna be like, well, you know, the dog got exposed, you know, life is life, and don't worry about it. Other people are like, that's my child, that's my fur child, I'm gonna sue you, right? You don't know that, so that's an uncertainty with you. We can go through all the risk reward elements on the left hand side of this screen, of this slide, what we can't account for is how people often react. And the reaction is sometimes worth because people are not reasonable. They're calling you because they think you're going to have a magic wand and solve their problem with no negatives. Unfortunately, that's kind of a lot of times we're doing our work where there are, there are no negatives, but sometimes there are. And it doesn't mean you did anything wrong. There's, there's called... There's malpractice, that's when you violate the label and you do stupid stuff, but there's also malocurrence where sometimes just bad things happen and you didn't do anything wrong. Okay, so this is what makes talking about risk so difficult. And here's an example. Are there leash laws? Well, of course there's leash laws. Leash laws occur almost throughout the entire country. But how often are they enforced? 
So here's Mr. Dog running around. Is he going to attack your bait station? So we're now into the third aspect of understanding risk, and that is the risk reward matrix. Do we know what we want? Will we still want it when we get it? So this is how we deal with risk. Oh, you know, what's, what's the rewards of using rodenticides? What's the risks of using rodenticides? How can we mitigate those risks? And again, we can only mitigate the risks that we know about. We can't mitigate risks that are unknown unless we know they're unknown. All right. Uh, so again, if you're having some trouble processing this, you're not alone. This is very difficult topic to deal with. So let's work this a little bit more. So the risk reward has to deal with uncertainty and then also the issue of chance. That is the probability times toxicity times exposure. So if you're feeling that this is complicated, it's because it is complicated. What you need to be able to do is you need to be able to think about how do you explain the chance of something bad happening and the kind of has of the kind of hazard that can occur. What is the damage that can occur? So we have the risk, the likelihood of something happening, and then what's the hazard? How bad is something going to be if it does happen? And that changes how we address things. You know, if we know we're going to fall off, a, if we slip and fall off a cliff, then we know we need to take better precautions for that particular event. But that's what we don't, we don't leash ourselves up to fall protection when we're running on a soccer field. Right? So we're addressing the types of risks that we're going to, that we know that we can encounter. And this is why you as a professional need to be evaluating your practices to be thinking of, is, am I doing the right thing here? Have I considered all the elements of the issue here? And as you gain more experience, you're going to have, you're going to have a better sense of what's likely to occur in a, in a particular area and make sure that your bait stations or rodent rodent applicate rodent bait applications reduce those risks. For example, you could just simply say company policy I'm only putting bait stations inside of structures in areas that are difficult for people to access. Attics, crawl spaces, uh, high areas maybe along the foundation, above drop ceilings or whatever. All right. Does that eliminate the risk of a child getting into it? No, but does it substantially reduce it? Absolutely it would. Does it make your job harder? Oh yeah, absolutely it does, right? You can say, I'm going to use steel bait stations all the time with a, with a real secure locking mechanism. Does that reduce your risk? Absolutely. Does that increase your cost? Absolutely. Okay. So how far do you want to go with this? All right, well, that's basically what I'm going to talk about here today. Let me just get to my last slide here. Whoops. Uh, but I hope that this has been helpful, if not maybe adding more fog to your understanding of the risk-reward concept. It is complicated. But try to get those two elements differentiate between chance, the likelihood of something happening, versus what is the hazard, how severe something is going to, what's the impact of that event if it does occur. And that will help it, you at a very foundational level explain this to your client. So what's the likelihood, man, of your dog getting into the bait? Well, it's low because of my bait stations. However, the bait that I'm using, your dog would have to eat X amount to start having a negative effect. That's one way to go about it. Now, I want you to be careful talking about ro effects with rodenticides because it is, LD50 is just sort of an average. That dog's response to the L response to a rodenticide may be radically different than the LD50. Because remember, LD50 only tells us what killed 50% of the population. That meant 50% lived, but some of those animals died well below that 50%. So you don't know if you're which which end of the scale that dog is going to be on.
Okay, so it's very, very complicated. Be careful of absolute statements. Think about your contract. Think about how you explain. And maybe we need to be charging a little bit more for rodent control to get people so that we're buying, using the right equipment and spending the time necessary on site to make sure that we are using rodenticides and, not, and any pesticide, not just rodenticides, but I'm, I'm focusing here on rodenticides. And our devices, whether they're traps or, or rodenticides, responsibly and really trying to minimize that, those untoward events that we're trying to, to avoid. Well, I'm Stephen Van Tassel. You've been listening to Living the Wildlife as part of the Pest Geek Podcast family. Again, do take the time, if you would, to subscribe to our channel, ring the bell. Uh, join us on Facebook for the Pest Geek Podcast family there. Definitely join us. We'd love to have you uh, be with us, ask questions, join the revolution, as Franklin calls it. And then lastly, definitely reach out to me. I'd love to hear from you, ideas for future shows. Uh, you can reach me at Wildlife Control Consult at gmail.com wildlife control consultant at gmail.com and by the way i am looking for norway rat scat house mouse scat and roof rat scat i'm willing to pay for it i'm also looking for photos for those of you who are uh, take photos of uh, rats and mice and their control methods and the damage they cause i would definitely love to talk to them but looking to buy use rights I'm not looking to own the photo. I'm just looking for the right to use the photo. So definitely reach out to me. You can reach me at wildlifecontrolconsultant at gmail.com. Well, you've been listening to Living the Wildlife. Why do we call it Living, Living the Wildlife? Because we want you to live the wildlife, not be the wildlife. Take care, everybody. <laughs>